we've asked Richard to be as challenging as possible. Um, um, in the event that you don't have questions for him, he'll be asking you questions. So um, I'd now, now like to pass over to uh, Richard from Arabs, and uh, he's going to talk to you about the case for smart building enablement. Hi everybody, um, before I get started I'm telling you a little bit about myself. Um, so I've been with Arab for just over 13 years. Uh, before that um, I worked for Trend Controls and, and Gen Fire Systems at a company called Nova. Um, for a few years spent some time at Terminal 5 at Heathrow and that was uh, being built as an engineer project manager. Uh, and then we got bought by the wonderful Honeywell, um, and uh, it all went downhill from there. So, um, <laughs> so I uh, decided to make a move into consulting. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is kind of um, what's built, built on a, a long period of time over the last 13 years. I spent a few years um, just designing HVAC control systems and getting incredibly frustrated about how all projects got squeezed at practical completion. Spent all this time trying to write a really great control spec and then not having any time to witness and test and actually get all, everything working properly. Uh, got incredibly frustrated with that, couldn't see a future in the controls industry, so actually spent a few years looking at the future of electric vehicles. Completely different, so very lucky I could do that now. That kind of went full circle and there was an opportunity to come back into the industry um, to think about post-occupancy evaluation and actually finding out about how buildings perform in use. So going and asking the occupants what they perceive as the performance of the building and actually looking at in-use energy. That kind of evolved. Um, oh, it's a good start, isn't it? Bear with me. Mm. Oh, that's in the presentation, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you know you can do a lot of security. There we go. Okay, so um, that gave me an opportunity to get back into the buildings industry and actually seeing how they perform, got back into controls going into operational buildings, getting data out of buildings, but it's really hard to get data out of building systems, and you never know what it means. Um, so we spent about four or five, the last four or five years looking at the Internet of Things, how we get data out of buildings, how we name that data, so we can actually start doing something useful with it. Um, it's also really difficult to implement smart buildings in the supply chain that we've got. Um, so the presentation I want to give you now is thinking about how we can do that more easily. How we can make things easier in construction projects and what can we take out of those construction projects um, and do afterwards. Hence, smart enablement. So I just want to give a bit of industry context on what's going on right now, what's driving smart buildings, kind of industry factors. What is a smart building? What does it mean to me, to you? The smart enablement process. The challenges, it's been brilliant, 15,000 people, these are some of the services that we offer. As I said, I lead a smart buildings team uh, in London. So some industry context. I think this is a really in interesting slide. The biggest companies by global market capitalization. You look back at 2002, only one software player. Looking now, Every single company is a technology company. I think that sets the tone of where we're going. Another piece of research, or two pieces of research. This one was done by James Langlaisel. There's another done by the World Green Building Council. Basically saying the 33300. Where do we need to be spending our time? It's not on the three, although that is incredibly important for our, our carbon. Um, our climate change initiatives, but as for, um, for corporate productivity, it, it's about spending time on the health and well-being of people. Um, McKinsey published a really good report a couple of years ago, um, imagining construction's digital future. 
This is where construction performs, right down at the bottom. That pretty much says it all. We've got a long way to go and a long way to improve. And so basically it, it focused on these areas. I'm going to focus on four. So what is a smart building? So, hopefully it's not this. Um, Internet of Things, yes, but the use cases that we've got to have have got to be have got to be useful. Have got to have got to provide something that the user needs, and we need to. Um, it needs to be invisible to them as well. It needs to be frictionless. So a, a smart building should fundamentally deliver on three criteria. It should enable connectivity. It should provide insights to people and it should support health and happiness for the people within the building. Our work starts with user journeys or use cases before we get anywhere near technology. So we're starting to think about a day in the life of. How is someone going to use that building? How is it going to be useful to them to bring technology touch points to that building? So before they even arrive at the building or pre-book a meeting, all the way through to the interaction with QR codes to get into the building or equivalent could be your device. Um, setting systems up in advance all the way through to the actual meeting itself. We are a smart building consultant across the portfolio for British Land, huge property developer in the UK. Uh, we're also working on individual smart building projects. These are the use cases that they're trying to draw into their properties for, uh, for the tenants and people that are going to occupy those buildings. They are leading the development market in the UK, way ahead of others, and they see, they're an early adopter, they see the importance of smart buildings. They probably don't understand what the true return on investment is yet, but they know they need to be in the space. So I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, our smart building enablement approach. So the diagram I'm showing here probably shows you where we've been, where we kind of are at the moment, best practice, and where we need to go to. This, traditional building systems, individual networks, everything's siloed. Kind of some middleware integration with one head end in the middle and then at the other side, everything talking to each other. Built on a building operating system. So this is what I would say is traditional best practice in the industry at the moment. If we're lucky, we get everything on one IT network. Then we have some middleware, and what we offer is one server database and a single pane of glass, as the industry likes to call it. For me, this just creates more vendor lock-in. It doesn't try provide true interoperability, it doesn't provide openness. The approach that we're advocating and we've been researching the last four years, I heard earlier the three layers, we're trying to break this down into multiple layers. We're kind of trying to take the devices, the hardware, that's commoditized in my opinion, have a physical data infrastructure, have an intelligence layer, could be your cloud storage, where you're running your machine learning, and then choice for your app applications. Pick and choose best in class, or build your own, because we're using internet standards. So this is the approach that we're adopting at Arup and taking to our clients. So we have systems at the bottom. It's a very simple diagram. It is missing lots of key bits, it will improve as we move along this presentation. Um, subsystems at the bottom. We need secure gateways, that is clear. Our products in this industry are not secure. They don't meet, as Lim said, IT standards. They don't come from the IT industry. We then want to have a platform, a building operating system. That can be in the cloud, it could be on-premise, a hybrid of the two. That needs to take care of all those things in that blue box and in the corner. What's nice about this, and I'll show you, is it scales. So a traditional smart or integrated building, whatever we want to call it, gets developed 
it's expensive, and you go to the next building, and you have to build the whole thing again. Same price. What we're saying here is create the software once in a scalable way. Make sure all your data is able to be consumed. It's open, it's standardized, using MQTT, using JSON, using a, a distinct naming convention. And then you can scale that to, to buildings across a portfolio. The cost gets amortized from the more buildings you deliver it to. What's also interesting about this, and as I was saying, diagrams get a bit more complex. Our smart enablement approach, the idea is to make things as simple as possible in the construction project. We don't want to add complexity. So we're saying don't carry out the interoperability in the construction project. Just deliver your vertical system, your lighting control, your HVAC control on its own. Concentrate on commissioning the mechanical systems. Concentrate on delivering the, uh, the lighting control systems. All we want to see you do is name things in a certain way, have a data validation process to convert from, say, BACnet into MQTT. So the additional element is a gateway and someone to validate. Everything else stays the same. That allows people to deliver the construction project and get away at practical completion. Because in reality, that is what happens, and, and we need to fit to that model. We're then saying, develop a software stack outside of the construction project. So this could be anybody. And we're also saying, don't implement it all at once. I'm going to move on. Don't don't implement it all at once. Define what your use cases are, your business, your business case. De define what the return on investment is. So we can try one for indoor mapping, wayfinding, or we can try one around space utilization. We'll test it on a building. And once we know there's a return on investment on it, then we'll scale it across the portfolio. On day one, yes, you might want three or four use cases. You know, otherwise it's not a smart building on day one but create the rest of the use cases when you know there is a return on it. I think the other thing that I just skipped over, this idea as well, is all about, as I said before, choice on applications, because we're opening data, we're making it available in a certain way. So challenges. So back now. That's come up already. Backnet objects that you guys will all know, I'm sure. How do we get consistent naming? When I've worked with products like Demand Logic on buildings and sucking up all the BMS data, how do I know I've got all the control valves? How do I know I've got all the temperature sensors? They're all named in completely different ways. Tagging, Haystack is trying to help with that. But there's so many existing buildings where data isn't named correctly. So for us, the absolute number one importance on smart building and enablement is naming. We're also thinking about how we give physical asset, physical points, assets to, uh, sorry, physical labels to our assets, QR codes, and how we apply our naming convention. This has to be. Um, still usable by the facilities manager. So yes, it's a distribution board, it's on the fourth floor, zone three, small power, for lighting circuit, etc., etc. But we're also adding a machine readable ID. So if it was a luminaire, it has a unique name, but the machine readable ID goes when the luminaire gets thrown away. So we can track that asset. That machine readable code should be the manufacturer's serial number. Then we can track the batch, we can track when it was built. Is there a certain problem with it? So we're thinking about that too. So these are the characteristics in our naming convention that we're adopting. Type name, the unique identifier, instance name, parameter names and physical labels. The second thing that I want to talk about, there's one thing there's naming. The other problem we have as we're moving to MQTT is that there's no standardization around topic names. There's no standardization about payloads. Um, 
We've been delivering some projects here where we're implementing naming convention. Um, we've been using a, a tool MQTT driver um, in a Trillium JS uh, or MQTT core. And it needs development, but, it's, but these guys are thinking about it. So there's a lot of work to do to think about how we standardize our MQTT payloads and how we move forward. But we do believe that that is the way forward. I agree, BACnet is going to disappear and JSON will be in controllers. And that is what, because JSON is what all the web developers in the world understand. So that's what we need to use. We've also been working with one site solutions on a different project with British Land. Again, using their MQTT driver and thinking about, okay, what does the payload structure look like? This is, for, uh, as I said, for British Land, but we will be, with a number of other companies, opening this up. It will be open source, it will be on GitHub, and I would urge you to join in and get behind it. My opinion is that um, things aren't moving quick enough with standardization, so I just think we just have to get on and do it. So, I think this covers on points that were mentioned earlier. Where do we need to develop in the industry? The IT standards and the security. Our controllers don't implement DHCP properly. Mostly have static IP addresses. That's not good enough for the, internet, uh, for the IT industry. We use broadcast messages for BACnet um, that can flood IT networks. We don't encrypt data in transit so you can get man in the middle attacks. We don't do over the air updates. We think, well, everything works at the moment, let's leave it as it is. And then we don't use one way to authenticate users. We need to do that too. So, how am I doing on time? Five minutes. Uh, okay, I'm doing okay. So, projects. Uh, one Finsbury Avenue. Uh, this is a project that's just moving towards practical completion with British Land at the moment. We've been using EasyIO FW controllers there, exposing MQTT. This is an old diagram, it's not the latest diagram. You see here, we were using uh, a BACnet driver for Syntronic, and we helped uh, Syntronic develop that BACnet driver. Through the project, we've now got them to develop an MQTT client, and they've also adopted our naming convention. We've got some figures up there just for context. You know, typically in the industry I see software points, 50 to 200 pounds, quite a broad range. 30p per software point exposed via MQTT. And they see this as uh, an advantage for them in the market. The trouble we're getting at the moment when I'm delivering these projects is that other BMS companies are saying, going to be a couple of hundred grand to implement that name convention. You know, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to get data out in an open way with those kind of attitudes? It's in everyone's interest to do this. Second project is uh, an Arab bill, X is our Arab office, uh, it was an internal research project. Um, what we decided to look at was our own meeting spaces. Why are our meeting spaces, why can you never get a meeting space? Um, yet, when the, the room booking system says they're booked, but when I walk past, the meeting rooms are free. So, just like Tommy said earlier, our approach is always to use the existing infrastructure if we can. So we want to get the data out of the existing lighting control system, out of the existing HVAC system. Why put in a load of IoT sensors when the data already exists? We only put additional sensing in when we couldn't find, solve a particular problem that we needed. That was when we put in a point graph sensor that counted the actual number of people in the room. This is our architecture, it's built on Amazon Web Services. We've got a, we've got a hybrid here, we've got some stuff inside the firewall on premise, we've got some stuff in the cloud. We're getting our Symtronic data via MQTT. This was the biggest bugger of all, the room booking system. There was like three, four hundred different tables there to get, just finding out when rooms were booked or not. Nightmare. Um, all into an open source database, InfluxDB, open source dashboarding, Grafana. 
um, then bringing in, and, and this was an interesting point, the business models, IoT sensors. You'll notice that we're having to flow up through their cloud to get it into another cloud. I believe that's going to wash out in time. It depends on people like us, how we specify them. My opinion would be all that data should flow through the client's cloud, and then if it needs to go to their service, it can. Because there is value of them getting that data, you only need to think about lifts. The more data they have, the better service that they can offer. So this is the, the Grafana dashboard from, from that project. What's really interesting about this, and I think is where you can start seeing the, the opportunity for machine learning. This is the, uh, the people counting center. CO2 overlaid with people counting, and then the PIL pinging, and the yellow is um, the room booking. You can see how well CO2 on a whole is starting to follow the people counting. Admittedly, we've got a block here, need to investigate, investigate that data, or is it? But very quickly, if we do this in enough rooms, we can start training a machine learning algorithm. Then we don't need to put in those uh, that people counting sensor. Don't have to pay for that sort of software as a service, and we can use the in existing <coughs> infrastructure that we've got. Uh, this is a, another project with British Land. Um, we're doing a little proof of concept with them uh, to provide uh, lighting control and air conditioning control in meeting spaces. Um, very very old Philips lighting control system. Um, we're told that we couldn't get the data out of <coughs> using North Commander to get that data, convert it into MQTT, using a, a, trend, a Trillium JS to convert to MQTT, and then this is the AWS platform that we built. When I first thought about this project, the client was absolutely adamant. We are going to do lighting control and ventil uh, air conditioning control in meeting rooms. Like, Why would you want to do that? There's buttons in the wall. Um, the project, the point of the project was about building this stack. But actually, the more I've worked with them, I've realized they've got a, uh, a serviced office offering. They want to reconfigure meeting rooms all the time. Why would they want sensors on the wall? Why would they want light switches on the wall if they're going to knock down partitions and reconfigure? The whole idea of building a, an app, wherever it is, lost it somewhere here. There's an app here somewhere. Um, building an app, or web app, gives them that flexibility. Finally, uh, this is a project we've been working on for the last four years uh, in London, a big technology company. What we're doing with these guys is adopting the same approach uh, that I've talked through here today. But that is all about creating an operating system for buildings. So <coughs> conclusions. What needs to happen to enable our buildings? We need a really clear naming and data strategy. Yes, this needs to be complementary to BACnet. Uh, sorry, complement, not complementary to BACnet. Sorry, complementary to Project Haystack, complementary to the BRIC schema. Very much believed in the linked data graphs. The devices need to be secure. We need to adopt IT standards. <coughs> Most importantly, the smart enablement approach should keep it simple. Keep it simple in the construction project. Do the clever stuff outside of the construction project. And that leads me on to the last one, the software development. So thank you very much. Thank you. So does anybody have any questions? Oh, Tom. Speakers on speakers, it's been a bit tough today. That more. There we go. Okay, but is there any reason you choose uh, ABS in, uh, in front of Azure or Google? No, 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 no. So we're developing on all of those platforms. It's just that particular client uses AWS. Okay. Um, what's interesting about AWS, um, they also have a product called Greengrass, which um, allows an on-premise implementation as well, so you can keep the two and two. I think that's really important. There needs to be a hybrid model in the whole. You lose connection to the internet. So if there's no more questions, that was the prompt to say there are no more questions, um, we'll move forward. Uh, Richard, can I ask you just to stay up for a moment yeah. on the stage?
Uh, I want to uh, bring Ken and Erica from the Control Awards organization. Yay! And uh, it's been a while. <laughs> but uh, we've got something for your uh, mantle bit. Sorry, Richard, uh, but as you can see, the day here is 2017. It's a while ago, isn't it? Well, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a shrinking world, but uh, we're... Uh, you're very popular in America, because I've been carrying that trunk around telling people that I'm you, so... <laughs> so, 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 so once and for all, we can congratulate Richard Reed for winning the Consulting Progressive Engineer of the Year 2017 from the Control Trends Awards. Congratulations, Reed. Get that in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, I uh, just want to congratulate uh, the event. Congratulate Mike <coughs> and Johan for a fabulous event. Congratulate this gentleman here. He's doing a great job. And the whole team behind uh, to set this up. These things are very, uh, very heavy uh, workloads going behind the curtains. And these guys did a fabulous job. We know a little bit about it. So, congratulations. Yeah, we do. We do. So, how many of you guys have had like a mate or a really good friend that you sort of were young with and you grew up together? And anybody? Okay, <laughs> okay we're not very popular here, are we? <laughs> but uh, but you know, you watch them grow up and they do really, really, really well. Well, Ken and I had the, the honor of watching Mike and Lem and the rest of the team sort of grow up in the U.S. Anyway, so uh, we're really proud of you guys. Very, very proud. Well, just to say a few more things about that. What a great uh, team that's getting stronger. In other words, we've seen additions in, in the Orient, we've seen uh, additions uh, in North America with Gina Elliott and Brian Klein, and now we see some great additions here in uh, Europe. And so we get the impression that there's one company that's really on the move, setting the standards, uh, and, the, and the awards that we're going to give out uh, have already been won by EGIO last year, 2018. Um, so what happens is we have the 2018 awards in 2019, so it gets a little bit confusing. But um, EasyIO has, in, in our opinion, because uh, we follow the trends, we get to talk to a lot of manufacturers, we get to talk to a lot of product managers, and see the passion and excitement, or the dread, or the setbacks, or the times in the market that haven't, uh, haven't met the calendar. EasyIO has set the standard now, probably for, uh, let's say, five years, where they have the top controller, top development, top you know leading technology. Everybody else is coming in behind and trying to follow. Look, I'm going to throw you a curveball here. I think we need to have the competition all over again. So we're going to start with our first award here. And uh, this is for... <coughs> oh, no, no, we have to go to uh, Pedro. Pedro! Well, okay. Please come up here. We're going to have uh, Mike and uh, Joe Martin. Set up. All right. <laughs> so uh, this is one of the three official awards. Uh, but uh, Pedro, great job. That's Pedro, one person of the year. Small vendor. Congratulations. Well done, Pedro. Okay, Mike Marston and Johan, could you please come up? Eric, can you give me this one out? Can I give this one out? Yeah, well, All right. so they cleaned up on the awards. So that just showed that, and this was voted on by 57 different countries. So uh, there's a big following for EJO around the world, Australia, Southeast Asia, uh, England was very, very big in North America. So the first award was the uh, 2018 Control Trends Vendor of the Year Small Manufacturer. Congratulations, guys. <laughs> the next award was the 2018 Best Dressed Award. <laughs> the 2018 Wireless Solution of the Year. And I think these guys are just doing a great job with that. So congratulations. <laughs> That's it. Uh, the mission of the Control Trends Awards is the recognition. Our industry is in dire need of more parity with the other industries. Uh, we saw the young lady who came in today. We need more young talent. And to do that, we need to tell more stories about the importance of our industry and gain parity with the different professions. Because right now, we had a study, and it's two years old now, but we're one of the fastest growing industries. In North America, we are the fastest growing industry. We have a chronic shortage of people. Uh, between now and 2024, 60% of our industry is going to retire. That's the technicians, that's the customer support, it's product engineers. And we're in dire need to you know, come up with ways to get more people into the business. All right. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, 
So, we're uh, coming into the final, final part of the day. Um, it probably feels like we're being presented to death uh, today. So, uh, but hopefully you've all found it informative. 